Hey, this is Nick Moke from Digital Trends. We have with us today Joey Roth, an industrial designer based in San Francisco, who is uh, joining us today to demo these fantastic ceramic speakers that are his creation. Joey, thanks for joining us. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, so let's start, I guess, with, uh, you, you know, where did these come from? What was your inspiration for these things? Um, well, I've always listened to music primarily on my computer, or if not on my computer, if I were playing like a record or something. I was always in a small space, so I never really even looked into big floor standing speakers because I just never lived in a place where I could have that amount of area. Um, but I found that the smaller the speakers got, the more their design and kind of the materials that were used were compromised in a way. Um, I guess because, you know, companies making these speakers thought people wanted them to be made out of the same materials their computers were made out of since they were going to be using them with the computers. So what I found was like, Computer speakers were typically made of like injection molded plastic and the actual designs, it looked like they were, you know, optimized for wind resistance rather than sitting on your desk. You know, you had right. these really sleek kind of futuristic plastic enclosures and that just did not appeal to me in terms of something I wanted to listen to music with. So the starting point for this design was trying to kind of convey the warmth and the human quality of good music. I mean, the music that I like isn't all like 90s futuristic techno, which is what I feel like those speakers are right. kind of the physical version of. Um, this is, you know, I've tried to use materials that are as unfinished as possible, as close to their natural forms, um, and also choose materials that are acoustically really good for building speakers out of. So this design is sort of uh, both of those things taken into account. Right. So you're an industrial design guy. How did you go about uh, sort of selecting these materials, taking in mind that, you know, they had to not only look good but function well acoustically? How did you go about sort of doing research and finding out, you know, settling on ceramic and, and maple and, and cork? Um, well, I started kind of like I start with any obsession that I have by going onto forums and um, websites online where you get like the the most intensely devoted people right. posting their ideas about audio and speaker components and which materials are best. So it's cool that the internet kind of lets you get to the nerdiest, most obsessive edge of any field like Absolutely. right away. Um, so I sort of started reading those posts and reading those websites, uh, understanding like what people were excited about and what they considered to be good and like what a good speaker design is. Um, and once I kind of, you know, for a few months got into that world, I started sketching out ideas um, based on my own aesthetic taste, but also based on, you know, what I had learned from those sites. Um, and once it came down to actually engineering the speakers, I worked with uh, an audio engineer to get the internal volume correct, uh, volume meaning like the internal space of the enclosures, right. uh, pick the damping material, like the stuff it's, you know, stuffed with. Um, and the cork actually came out of a conversation I had with the audio engineer, um, trying to figure out how we could get a sealed enclosure, which kind of maintains like the, the back pressure on the driver so that the sound is mm -hmm. a lot cleaner, but also allow some of the pressure to escape so that it doesn't have that tinny quality that a lot of sealed enclosures do. Um, and the compromise you came up with was a cork because it's a little bit permeable, it's much softer than the ceramic, um, but it does maintain some back pressure. And luckily, cork ended up looking really nice with the ceramic, and I was able to kind of run with that. And a lot of the des the final design came out of conversations like that. Right. You know, we want to achieve this with the sound. Um, these are the materials we need to use. And then I tried to figure out how could I put it together in the most aesthetically and kind of, you know, materially pleasing way possible. So this is sort of where you ended up, where there sort of prototypes that, uh, you know, took a, a different direction or different materials you experimented with? Um, well, the first design before I kind of knew anything about audio and I was just going by, you know, what looks cool was sort of a speaker with a felt cone that basically kind of like came out of it, almost like yeah. a megaphone type of thing. And I thought it looked cool, but it, it would have sounded like crap if I'd actually <laughs> built it. So as soon as I kind of got serious and I knew this is the product I wanted to do, um, I started doing different 3D models and again working with the audio engineer to figure out um, what's going to work, what's not going to work. Um, so by the time I was building physical prototypes, I'd pretty much decided on this basic design. And from there it was really just refining the electronic components and the drivers I was going to use in order to get the, the sound that, that we really wanted to achieve. Um, 
So yeah, it's, the, the prototype really didn't change much from the first one to what you see here. Right. So could you uh, bore us, if you will, with a few of the technical details of, the, <laughs> of what's going on here um, outside of the, the beautiful exterior? Yeah, totally. Um, so basically, the, we kind of started the design with the amp. And the amplifier is based on a chip called the TriPath 2024. Um, and this chip is very inexpensive by like audiophile equipment standards. But mm -hmm. building an amp around this, this chip, um, it's called a T-amp. Uh, produces really, really transparent, um, very, very good sound for the price that it's in. Um, by transparent, I mean that the signal that enters the amp, um, it's kind of ramped up in order to get to the power that the speakers need, but it's not colored by that ramping up process. Right. It's just sort of what the sound engineer who made the track intended. And that was kind of the, the overall like sound goal with these. I wanted it to be like the shortest, most simple path from the source to your ears, so that it's not really colored at all. Um, so the, the amp is based on the tripath, and I kept it the controls as simple as possible, just a volume slider on the front. Um, you have the binding post connections on the side, which is a little easier, I think, than having them on the back. Right. Um, then on the back, you just have the input, the on-off switch, and the power, power input. Because um, I really think an amp, all it needs to do is amplify the signal really well. You know, you don't need a bunch of controls that could do things that you'll, you know, aren't, aren't really critical for just getting the sound to the speakers. Um, and then once the sound gets to the speakers, um, it travels via copper cables that I sourced um, based on just stuff I'd read about, you know, audio <laughs> cables. And people get really crazy about cables. So I needed to kind of cut it off at a certain point right. and say, I'm going to use this good quality copper, but I'm not going to make the cables more expensive than the amplifier or anything else. Because, you know, I think that once you have very, very, very expensive components, then cables can kind of make the difference. Mm -hmm. But you can, for some reason, people can get really insane about their cables, where in my experience and from talking to other people, it makes you know, such a small difference in the final quality. So right. I put more development time and, and money into the drivers and to the, uh, the amplifier. So anyway, once it gets to the speakers, um, these drivers are made by a company in Taiwan called Tang Band, which has a really good reputation among DIY speaker builders, and mm -hmm. that's how I found them initially. Um, and it's a modified version of one of their standard drivers. And it's four inch diameter and it's full range, which means that it allows me to use just one driver instead of a subwoofer and, uh, or not a subwoofer, a woofer and a tweeter. Um, so this kind of reproduces uh, frequencies from 70 hertz to 20,000 kilohertz in one driver, mm -hmm. which is cool because it allows me to do this um, cylindrical design without having like a smaller driver mounted here and a larger one mounted right. there. And it also allows me to avoid using a crossover. Um, a crossover is basically a, um, an electronic component that uses a resistor and some other parts uh, to split the frequency right. into like the high part that goes to the tweeter and the low part that goes to the woofer. Um, and by avoiding a crossover, I'm able to keep the signal path much more simple and in my mind, much more true to the source. Right. Um, and then, other than that, the enclosure is basically just stuffed with a bamboo fiber that helps cut down resonance. 